All right, everybody, we are back and in studio. I have right now the probably the only person I know who's had a three way with Jim Norton. He's in town promoting his brand new book, which is called Everybody's Awful Except You. We just got off the Monsters of Rock cruise. Jim Florentine, welcome back to another fucking podcast. What's going on, man? Yeah. Um, well, Ron Jeremy had a threesome with Jim Norton, too. Well, I don't really know Ron. Yeah. I, I think Ron actually might know who I am because I'm at the Rainbow so fucking much, but I, I wouldn't say I know Ron. So I guess uh, you're like uh, the winner by, by uh, technicality, I guess. Right, yeah, no, it's, you know, when you're, you know, doing up road gigs, some shit's going to go down. Yeah, you know? this is true, this is true. We just got off the Monsters of Rock cruise. Uh, this is what, your this is your second one? Second one, yeah. Second one? Yeah. How would you like this one compared to the I like this one? one better. The first one, I was a little, I wasn't sure how I was going to like it. I've been on a cruise before. I wasn't a crazy about it. I'm not a rock cruise, just a regular cruise. And, uh-huh. um, uh, the, yeah, I was a little timid, you know, I was like, all right, it's going to be all right. And, but this one, I was a lot more comfortable, and it was great. It was a great time. Has your uh, liver recovered? Yeah, you know what? I paced myself with that. I'm not too bad. I know if I see you late, it's going to get ugly <laughs> right. on the cruise. You know what I mean? So I know. So I've only went up there one night. But the other the times, you know, Don's always up there. And I'm like, Don's yep. going, yeah, I'm going. I'm like, all right, yeah, you, you know, you won't be going to bed till 4 Yeah, Don, in the Don's like me. He's always got a beer in his hand. Always. He's a professional. Always. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we're kind of like peas in a pod. So yeah. he has better chops. Right, yeah, so, uh, no, but it was great, though, man. You know, it was just a killer just watching all those bands. and uh, Who uh, who really stuck out for you? Kicks. Yeah, Kicks. Fuck Loved yeah. seeing those guys live. I missed them for, like, 20 years when they would come around. I finally saw, I saw them last year on the cruise for the first time in, like, 20 years live, a lot mm-hmm. of these bands. And then uh, Queensryche, really, I, I haven't seen them with Todd. They were amazing. Y&T is always unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, Raven was great. I've liked those guys since the beginning. I saw them when they first came over to the States back in the day. So it was, it was great seeing those guys. Um, I lost was really good. Faster Pussycat. Always. And the Atomic Punks, the Van Halen tribute band. Yeah. That was killer when they played on the beach in Haiti. Yep, yep. It's freaking 80 and sunny and drinking yeah. beers and they're playing some Van Halen. It's fucking nothing better. Fucking love it. We actually, I, I guess we technically warmed up for them on the uh, pool stage because I did the Ace Fraley thing. Right before they played, so I guess I can say I opened up for them. Right, yeah, 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 yay me. Um, so the brand new book just came out on, on the twentieth. Yeah, the twentieth. Yeah, twentieth. Um, obviously I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I was kind of looking over the, uh, looking over Norton's little uh, little forward here. You've, I didn't realize that you've been in comedy for this long. I mean, he's talking about you know your roommates and. Um, you know, talking about like 1991. When did you actually get into comedy? Yeah, we started like around 90-91 is when I first met him. We both pretty much uh-huh. started. I was started a little before him, and I was just running a, a uh, an open mic at a bar. It was a strip club during the day, and it was a rock club at night, and I was the DJ there. Mm-hmm. And on Monday nights, they gave me like a comedy night, and they paid me like 100 bucks, and I would pay like a headline or some guy that's been around a while, and then I just have open micers, and I would host it each week. And then that's where I met Jimmy, came down and stuff. So we've been friends ever since. Who was, uh, when I was talking to uh, Don on the first Monsters of Rock cruise that he was on, um, he was kind of saying that you really kind of pushed him, pushed him out there to, to do comedy. And he kind of did that to me, actually, on that same cruise. Um, did anybody actually do that for you? Um, no, not really. I just saw, when I saw, like, Dice and Kinnison, bring like a rock star mentality to uh stand up. Mm-hmm. I was always I always intrigued by stand up, but I always wanted to be in a band. I was more of a musical. I just didn't have any talent, so I was trying to figure out how I could not work a 9 to 5 job. <laughs> right. So I had a, a DJ business. I was DJing a rock club and doing weddings and shit like that and and then uh when I saw Dice and Kinnison, like all of a sudden Dice was, like a rock star with his leather jacket and they're doing arenas and Kinnison has his band and all the metal guys. I'm like shit, man. I got to get up there and try that. So that it took me a little while, like another year or so, before right. I had the balls to get up on stage to do it. But once I did it the first time, like this is what I want to do. Yeah, it's it's kind of like a drug. I mean, I remember the first time I did it, it was like I, I think I had five minutes, and I'm like, this is gonna be over. This is gonna be the longest five minutes of my life, or over faster than the fir- faster than the first time I had sex. You know, um, how you can, long you can last five minutes? <laughs> yeah, I guess. How, I don't know. Any, Mar- any, call me any... a, call me a marathon runner. Is that including taking your clothes off? Uh, yes. Uh, also including foreplay and uh, begging. 
And, uh, yeah, well, so do you last about a minute and a half. Minute and a half. There yeah. you go. Uh, on a good day. That's all right, though. You know, sometimes you're just so excited. You know, like, you're really hot. I couldn't help it. Or, oh, my God, there's a girl in my bed. Yeah. I'm like, wow, it's not my hand. <laughs> right. Exactly. How long did it take you to get comfortable on stage? It took me a while. Um, you know, because you agree. It's weird because my, uh, my son's been going up. He's seven doing stand-up. And everyone says the st- he already has the stage presence down, which is like, you know, at least, se- you know, you need the jokes. Forget the jokes, but 75% right. of it is the stage presence where you don't mm-hmm. look nervous, you don't look green, because the audience can sense that. Oh, yeah. And he stalks the stage, walks around, uses it all. to make. Because I've taken him a bunch of concerts, so he watches. You know, my nephew plays in a band. I'll go up and I'll sing with him. So he's seen it. So he's, he already has it down. It takes a while to get that down. So I don't yeah. know. I mean, probably five, six years in maybe is when I really started feeling comfortable. Nine years, they say, usually is when you really start becoming a, a good comic. It takes nine years to really become a good comic. Oh, shit. I got a long way to go. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could take, it depends, you know, does, you know, we know uh, buddy Dean Del Rey, you know, Dean. Dean's mm-hmm. out there every night. He's been doing it like yeah. six years. He's, he's an animal. He's yeah. doing two, three shows every night, no matter what. And he's getting it great because he's putting the extra time in. You know, mm-hmm. you think it's harder now, though? No, no, because there's a lot more avenues for you to do, you know, to build an audience. OK, you know, so you could do it. With, I don't know if you got a good Instagram page, you got some kind of thing you're doing there or on YouTube or something or so you can get out there and you could just build up your own audience without the industry, which is great. You can go around it and then eventually mm-hmm. they'll find you if you have a big enough audience. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh the difference between the the East Coast and the West Coast, um, comedy wise, I mean, have you seen it change? Is it? Um, you know, the East Coast guys were always like rougher and edgier, uh-huh. and uh, had more of an attitude and were not as happy go lucky. Mm-hmm. That's what it always seemed like. So when we came out to the West Coast to do comedy, some of the crowds were like, "Whoa, why is this guy so angry?" But that's just the way we are, right? That's just a style of comedy. But now I think it's over the last 10 or 15 years, it doesn't matter. All the crowds are pretty much the same. Well, I suppose with, um, obviously with that metal show and you got, you having that crowd and people knowing who you are, it's a lot different. Well, even if I go on a comedy store on stage and they don't know, half, most of the room doesn't know who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, it's still, I don't feel it, you know, it's not, it, it, it used to be so PC out here, like on stage and everything, like view or dirty little mm-hmm. lowbrow or edgy you, you might not they might you might get groans you don't get it anymore so the crowds have come come around so you could pretty much you know the east coast guys can work the west coast no mm-hmm. problem is it is it harder now though with um with this pc culture that we're in or do you see that kind of uh breaking down no it is not i don't think it's harder they're not coming to the clubs that's for sure i think the media blows it out of proportion you know I always, when I play a club, I always talk to the club owner. I'm like, are you getting any more complaints about material and p- people complain about the comedians because they made a rape mm-hmm. joke or whatever it is? And they're like, not at all. They go, I think people know. They research the comics coming in. There's videos of everybody online, and they know what they're coming into. And I think people want to go to a comedy club and just forget what's going on in the outside world. And they just want to laugh. And mo- most, the whole country is not, you know, on this whole bandwagon of, you know, right. just cleaning up this sexual harassment and stuff. Like, it's like Hollywood telling the the rest of the country to clean it up when you guys were doing it the whole time. Why is that involved? What does a guy in Michigan that works in a fucking, at a gas station have to do with it? You know, he's mm-hmm. like, I wasn't, you guys were doing that shit and now you're scolding each other. Now you're scolding us. Right. You're the one who was taking advantage of everybody. And, hey, if you're not giving me a blow job, you're not getting a roll and, you know, come to my trailer and I'm going to lock the door, all that shit. It wasn't us. Mm-hmm. You know, so everyone's like, fuck you. Why, why are you preaching to us? Right. Well, you know, especially on all the award shows, they're using that as a platform. Yeah, and that's, like, that's why nobody watches it. The ratings right. are down twenty four percent. Like, I don't want to see that shit. Just tell me what, what, you know, you know, you you guys knew exactly who was doing it, and you just mm-hmm. let it slide, and you looked the other way, and you participated in, it, and you said, all right, if I blow this guy, I'm going to get a role, but at least I'm going to get this role in a, in a big film. So you made that choice. To, you know, you didn't have to do it. Right, exactly. You know, you know, so that now why are you blaming me 15 years later because you sucked Harvey Weinstein's dick? That right. nothing and, to do with me. Exactly. And where did it get you? Right, exactly. And you you're crying get about it now. Award. You yeah. were in all, you know, all the Miramax films, and you'd also, you knew what you were doing. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so I, I think that the audience is like, look, I, I'm not into this. This isn't me. I never raped a girl. I never, you know, she said no. She said no, and I didn't do anything. You know, that's the Hollywood actors with their self and 
you know, sense of entitlement. They're like, hey, I get everything. Too bad. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Look who I am. You better do something. So, but so, but it hasn't come back to the comedy club, which is great. So, well, I don't good. care. Like, if somebody complains, I go, look, I don't know. I don't live in your world. So, too bad. Well, I mean, one of the reasons I thought about that is because last night I was listening to the, what I think is the greatest comedy record of all time, The Day the Laughter Died. Yeah. And, you know, he's going into the women comics bit and uh, the, the Indians bit, the Native American stuff. And I'm like, God, I don't know if he could get away with that in this day and age. He's doing it. I just saw him last night at the Canyon Club. Uh, how was that? It was great. It's completely sold out. Of course Bob. it was. And he's doing that material. He's taking a completely different angle on, on right. all of the stuff. The sexual, yeah, he doesn't care. And the crowd's loving it. I saw him in New Jersey last weekend. I saw him do four shows, and the crowd's are loving it, you know? They understand it's a joke, you know what I mean? Like, right. people could take a joke, and, you know, the people that are, are so uptight about it probably aren't coming to the comedy clubs anymore. Well, I think a lot of it, too, is people just get their keyboard warriors. You know, they get on Facebook, they get on Twitter, and they fucking whine about everything, and they're, they're not the ones at the comedy clubs. Right, and if they are, it's like, okay, well, if someone made, like, there was a guy in Boston on a, um, a sports station, he made a, a Chinese voice. Mm-hmm. Tom Brady's agent. Oh, yeah, agent. yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, and the guy got suspended, and it's like, you know, issue apology. Who did he apologize to? Who was offended? Right. Nobody. You know what I mean? But the station made him do it. He's like, if it was offensive. You think guys that in Boston that listen to sports radio and want to hear about the Red Sox and the Patriots are going to be mad because they're going, oh, 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 You think anyone was like, hey, man, I'm, I, I, I'm writing a letter. Nobody. Nobody right. was offended. Right. Well, I think Bill Hicks, he talked about that on uh, Stern. I mean, obviously – a long time ago and it's like and i'm not don't i'm not quoting this because i, I don't have the quote in front of well, me well he's but, not gonna sue you well you yeah exactly you know I mean? but you know he's like you know why should i kowtow to one guy with a crayon who wrote a letter when there's you know thousands of other people that thought this was funny yeah you know i think it was when he got uh it was like right after letterman bumped him right his, his last appearance his, yeah yeah you got to realize, like, as I tell other comics, like, me, if you can get, like, 25%, say, of people to like you, like the population to like your style of humor, that's great. Don't focus on the other 75%. Because if you focus on that, you're just going to be a mediocre act. You're going to try mm-hmm. to fit in with everything, and you're just going to be ordinary. You're not going to be good. You're going to be a middle-of-the-road gut person that nobody even will, you know, want to go see because, ah, yeah, that guy, yeah, he's all right, you know. So just do it your way and don't focus on the other seven. Who gives a fuck about them? Right. You don't need them. You know what I mean? Focus on the people that like your stuff. Well, I mean, it goes back to Motorhead. What do they do? They always put yeah. out Motorhead records. They put a Motorhead record out, exactly. And even, the, like, the 80s bands were on the Monster Rock Cruise, so, like, mm-hmm. they're playing in their audience. Yep. That boat is sold out all the time. There's, like, 3,000 people on it. They're loving it. They do two shows on the boat, across, you know, over the course of five nights, and they're all, and they're playing their and the audience loves it. Like so, yep. so what? All right, if Kicks puts a new record out, they're not getting it on the Tonight Show with Johnny with Jimmy Fallon. But who gives a shit? Right. They got their built-in audience. They're touring, you know, and people will see them, and they got a nice following. So good, play to them. They're not trying to crack regular radio anymore, right? Right. And, and they're just right now. I'm going to write an album that Kicks fans are going to like. Well, how many bands are actually trying to crack regular radio now, anyways? Yeah, I mean it's true, but. But, but, you know, just focus on who likes you, you know, mm-hmm. and that's all that's, you know, so like my book, if someone picks it up and like, oh my God, I don't, I don't like this humor at all. This why is this guy picking everything apart? Why is he so angry over uh, someone's Facebook post? I'm like, yeah, well, this isn't for you. You know, so some people are going to go, I don't like, this isn't my humor at all, but other people are going to love it, you mm-hmm. know? So I don't care about the people that don't like it. I'm like, right. whatever comment it is. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, I, I don't blame you for not liking it. How long did it take you to start writing jokes? Um, what do you mean? In, um, like as you were starting out, I mean, it, I I wrote a bunch of stuff. You always think when you start out that everything you write is great, right? Like you can't edit anything. This is amazing, and it's usually in long form, and you really need to cut it down. It's long winded, mm-hmm. and um, it takes a while. You know what I mean? It's trial and error, and then eventually you start getting the hang of it. Like I better cut this, get right to the point. You know what I mean? I don't need all this fat in there. Cut it down a little bit, and because you know you're not you're st- you're not good yet, so mm-hmm. you're not going to be a good storyteller two years into your career. Once you're comfortable on stage, you could do that. So, um, no, it takes a while. You just I always tell comics I go when you're breaking in, do your best whatever the five minutes is that you have. Do that every night. Hone that. Make it make sure it's good. And if you want to do new stuff, 
you know, if you're auditioning for a place, like at the improv or something like that, do mm-hmm. your best stuff. And then hone and do that every night, but you could sprinkle in new shit as you're working it. But always keep working that that stuff that works because you always want to do well because they'll always have your back if you right. do well. But if you want to just think I'm going to do new material every night, and you're only doing comedy a year, and the other shit isn't even that good. So why is this stuff going to be any good? Mm. You know, pro like a Bill Burr can come in. I got five minutes. I'm going to try, and maybe none of it works. He still doesn't know. Well, you never know as a comic if it's going to work or not until you get in front of a crowd. So I say just build a set like that. You know, keep doing mm-hmm. the stuff that works and keep building from there. How long did it take you to break out of the uh, um, the open mics? Um, it was pretty quick because uh, there was guys like Rich Voss and uh, Bob Levy and a couple other mm-hmm. like local Jersey guys that took a liking to me and Jim Norton and took us out on the road with them to open for us. They thought we were scumbags and, you know. Just, you know, I had the long hair and shit like that. Right. So they're just like, oh, these guys are cool guys. And we get paid like 25 bucks and we drive them to the gigs. And we just happen to be on stage. And they already had all the connections in these clubs. Like, hey, I got this guy who's going to MC. Just pay him 25 bucks. He's going to do 10 minutes. So we were working a lot right off the bat. Because, they, you know, they, they liked us. We were like two degenerates. They liked our stories and stuff. Like, these guys, mm-hmm. are, these kids are fucked up. You know, we like so they brought us on the road. So they gave us a lot of road work right off the bat. So it helped us you know, develop our, uh, our sets. And, um, I, I saw something in that forward too. You, you did Woodstock. Yeah. Were you on like the main stage? Were you on a side stage or what? A side stage. A side stage. Yeah. Okay. It's Woodstock 93, I guess, or 94. 94. That was the yeah. one King's X was on, right? Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they wanted comics. They decided they want to do comics. So like 20 comics from New York city. When we took a bus out there, we stayed in the tent and, uh, it was really disorganized, but we did a couple comedy shows on these smaller stages you know, a few hundred people were watching, but right. it was just cool. I went out and did one, it was so disorganized that I said, I want to say that I performed at Woodstock. I went up and I told one joke and I walked off stage because <laughs> nobody was paying attention. I, go, I just right. want to say that I did Woodstock. I told, I, I was up there for no more than 25 seconds. I remember some guy saw me because I saw you at Woodstock. Why'd you walk off stage after one joke? I, go, I just wanted to get a set in. I just want to say I, I performed at Woodstock. Oh my God. That's oh Scotty Strickland checking in from Canada. He was on the Monsters Cruise. What up? Uh, if you see uh, Scotty on the next cruise, make sure that uh, you say the word racist to him because he has to take a drink. It's kind of his trigger word. Okay. All right. I'll introduce you to him. He's a good guy. I'm sure you met him. Um, is it tough doing that? I mean, obviously, Woodstock is a whole different different uh, monster, but like uh, opening up for bands, is that is that tough as a comic? Yeah. I like the challenge, though. You know, um, yeah, I knew it was going to be tough. If I never had that, if I never was on that metal show, I wouldn't have done it. Because, it, you right. know, going in about 70% of the crowd knows who you are, so you have an advantage for a few minutes anyway. Mm-hmm. But if you're not good, they'll, you know, they'll turn on you. But at least you need that first two or three minutes of big buffer. So, but I just always liked the challenge. Like, I was like, all right, I just finished the comedy special, and, like, I want to do something different. And I got that offer, and I'm like, look, I'm going to be in front of twelve, thirteen thousand people a night. Let me try this. So uh, it's nerve wracking when you're out there. You're like, why am I doing this when I could just be in a club where mm-hmm. people pay to see comedy? They're calm and they're going to listen. They're going to be a great audience. I'm like, why do I do this to myself? But for some reason, I do. Well, I mean, plus, you know, you made all those connections through the TV show. Yeah. You know, so that's. Yeah. And it was just I knew I knew going in as long as the, somebody the audience knew me that I was going to give it a shot, you know, and see how it was. Mm-hmm. So, and plus you're like, all right, I'm on tour with Slayer, Megadeth, and Anthrax. <laughs> right. This is fucking great. I'm watching right. the shows every night. I'd be here if I wasn't working. I, I mean, growing up a metal fan, were, were you surprised at the people that you got to know because of the TV show? Yeah. Who were, who was it like, oh my God, I can't believe that I know this person now. Well, you know, just the guys coming through the show and knowing you and, um, um, uh, well, like the other day, like last week, uh, Ozzy sent out a tweet about my book, said, hey, man, our good friend Jim Florentine's got a book out. Jim Norton wrote the forward, you know, go buy it. Here's the links. And I was like, holy shit. Yeah, that's huge. I know. It was, you know, it was, my whole childhood was Ozzy. My whole life has been Ozzy. I've uh-huh. seen, you know, a million times. And it's just, so it was just, it, you know, it just, and then Lemmy, you know, Lemmy was around. You know, he did the, that metal yeah. show like four or five times. And I was on the HBO show with him down and dirty with Jim Norton. Lemmy was like the DJ. So just to get, and, and Motorhead was a big part of my life, too. And then mm-hmm. Saxon, you know, you see these guys, and Biff knows. So so it's it's really cool. You would never think that that would happen, you know, as a kid that you would, uh, you know, 
be knowing these guys later. And even on the boat, like y and I was a huge yeah. y and fan. So I'm doing the Q&A with Dave Menachetti. I'm like, holy shit. And the guys in Raven, you know, mm-hmm. when, I was, when they came to the East Coast, when they came from England, did some shows with Metallica, you know, and I was a big fan of those guys. And they're still around. I had lunch with them. It's, it was really cool. I will say this. Dave and Joe Manichetti are the two of the nicest people I've ever met in this entire business. Yeah. Amazing. They're amazing. Yeah. Fucking amazing. Uh, no, this is your second book, correct? No, first. I mean, I did like a pamphlet back then. Oh, okay. Like, yeah, just like a little, you know, right. I self public, but it wasn't even a book. All right, so this is... It wasn't in a store or anything like that. Right. I just sold them on my gigs. But is, yeah, it's the first book. Yeah. Is, is this like uh, like an autobiography type thing? I mean, cause I obviously... It's a little bit of that, and it's yeah. a, a lot of rant, a lot from my podcast. Okay. A lot of my rants from my podcast make it fun of social media. Right. I put out people people's actual Facebook posts in there and just, just nice. dissect them. Yeah. Nice. You know. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about that last time you were on. We were talking about uh, food posts and how much you hate those. Yeah. Because I'm guilty. Right. <laughs> I'm, you know, guilty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm guilty. I can't yeah, help I it. I don't mind, but yeah, I say in the end of the book, I like I don't want people to think like, oh, man, I can't do that because I don't like it. I'm like, I don't give a shit. I mean, if you want to do it, that's fine. Because I said, look, I put a point in there. I said, I like heavy metal, right? Mm-hmm. And to a lot of people, it's stupid. It's ridiculous. And, like, why would you still like that music maybe in the 80s i liked it for a little while so if someone's like dude come on you still judas priest you listen are you what are you fucking 10 years old uh-huh. it's not gonna make me go you know what maybe i'm maybe i'm you know maybe <clears throat> maybe i should start listening to drake <laughs> <laughs> it's never gonna change my mind so i don't care so and people yeah, are right yeah, yeah, yeah. totally understand but it's not gonna it's not gonna affect me in any other way so when people post pictures of food or whatever i make mm-hmm. fun of them like look I don't want you not to do it if that works right. for you and you like doing it, do it. But I'm, you know, I'm gonna make fun of it. That's what comics do. You're gonna pick it apart. Exactly. Your friend walks in a room with a bad shirt on. He's gonna get it for 20 minutes. You know what I mean? It's just yeah, gonna, exactly. It's just, just busting balls. Right. Well, oh, here's a good example. On uh, we did the Labruski cruise, and uh, it was this weird combination of like OAR and like jam bands and um, Molly Hatchet, and because they combined with like the Southern Rock Cruise and there's this jam band on there and I can't remember the name of the band and their bass player dressed up like Superman at all times and he actually legally had his cha- name changed to Super Man. Well, you know what we do at karaoke. He comes walking into the karaoke lounge at 3 a.m. dressed as Superman. We're fucked up. We're going to fuck with him. He wanted to throw down. Really? It's like, dude, just, it, it, it's jokes. What were you doing? Like, Oh, we're just fucking with him. Like we do. I mean, I was drunk. I don't remember what we said. Because I know you were telling me a story how you were messing up some guy's name just to fuck with him. Oh, yeah. That was Mike Portnoy. Yeah. We were calling him Mark. Yeah. Dude, my (laughs) name's Mike. It's like, I know. Just go along with it. It's like, why is he calling me Mark? It was funny. Yeah. But he was fucked up, too. (laughs) Because I remember you guys were like, uh, you when I was hanging up there, you're like, Don Jameson, you would call me Don or whatever. Don's oh, yeah. over there having a drink, whatever. Like you just, yeah. I'm like, I don't care. I think yeah, it's funny. It's, it's what we do. I mean, th- that's look part at my of my coffee cup. Look, look at the name on here, Steve. Yeah, can I have a name? <laughs> yeah, Steve. I'm not gonna give the right name. I'm just gonna be. I right. usually say Jennifer when I go to Starbucks. Like, can we have a name? I go Jennifer. Nice. And they stare at me. I'm like, yeah, what's? And they'll laugh. I'm like, what's so funny? That's my. That was my dad's name. I got his name. I'm like, oh wait a minute. I, I, I should say this. Portney was not fucked up because Portney does not drink. Yeah. So, um, so I, I apologize about that. I, I was wrong. It, it was late. I was fucked up. He probably wasn't because he was yeah, drink. no, but yeah. the ball, but that's what you, that's what you do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a weird way of showing affection. Oh, here's a, a question from Canada. Has anybody come to your show or through social media that came out as a fan that made you go, holy crap, this person is a fan aside from Ozzy and Lemmy. That way, that what? Um, anybody that's come to your show or, uh, through social media, came out as a fan of you and you didn't realize you were a fan they were a fan or oh my god they are a fan through social media yeah or basically uh, i'll read it again has anyone come to your show or through social media that came out as a fan that made you go holy crap this person is a fan so but it's just somebody in general like yeah maybe yeah, like a, yeah. an actor or yeah 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 a yeah. rock star or yeah, something yeah, like that yeah. um well, you never know because sometimes you'll uh, they'll just say that. Um, I just did the Howard Stern wrap up show in New mm-hmm. York this past week, and Paul Fague was on it, the director who did um, fuck. 
He did a bunch of b- big movies. <laughs> I forget, but yeah, he's a pretty <laughs> right, right, right. Guy. And he's like, dude, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. I, you know, I loved you on Crank Anchors and stuff like man. I wonder if he just did Wikipedia. It really means it. So you never know. But um, right. uh, I love when the rock guys are. When the rock guys find out, like they're big comedy fans, because most of the most of the music guys want to be comedians. Comedians want to be rock stars. Yep. So they all listen to comedy albums. We're on a tour bus, so that's always really cool. A lot of the bands go, "Dude, we listen to your prank calls before we, uh, you know, start practice or something like that." Or we listen to them on the bus and we just quote all your shit that's on the call. So I was like, "Wow, that's pretty cool." Were you ever afraid of getting um, um, being stuck as the prank call guy? No. Because you just branch out into something else, you know what I mean? I, I always knew I'd stand, stand up to fall back. But mm-hmm. whatever works at that time, why not right. do it? You milk it. It's the same with that metal show, you know? It's like, are you going to be labeled just as like a heavy metal comedian? It's like, no, that's just part of what I do over right. there. And then I'm always, you know, so. But no, I never worried about that. Yeah, I was just kind of curious about that because I had Gas on and Craig Gas, and we were talking about, you know, being labeled as the impression guy or right. the, the guy that does Gene Simmons, you know? So I was just kind of curious about your take on that. So. Yeah. Um, no, I don't get, you know, it doesn't bother me. Whatever. Whatever works for you. Look, if I can make a living making prank calls, I mean, it's fucking God bless America. <laughs> right. You know, if I can make some money doing that, I'd be doing, it. I'd be doing <laughs> right? it for free. If I could make some money jerking off on the corner, I'd probably be doing it. Well, maybe I, no, I couldn't. I'd give you five yeah. bucks if you're going to Really? Do it. yeah, it's just hot. Don't, um, just don't, you know, block the door if I want to leave. <laughs> I, I just won't shoot it in your general direction. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, on a principle, you know, because I care. Right. Or just give me a warning. <laughs> it's coming. Yeah. Move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back to social media a little bit. Um, is it tough for you to go through, so- look at social media now? I mean, with, with everybody whining about everything. and I don't look at too much. I'll do it to uh, use it just for promotion. Mm-hmm. I don't really get involved in the drama. I don't really look at comments. I don't care. I got things going on. So it doesn't really, you know, but it is great for promotion. To get your yeah. shit out there, people follow you. They can see what you're doing. So I like to like it for that, but I don't. Uh, you know, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, you got to post it. You know, I got to post something. And, you know, it just I feel like you know sometimes it'll take me 20 minutes to post it to Twitter. Then I got to go to Instagram. Then I got a Facebook, and then I got a Facebook fan page. And I'm like, just fucking holy shit. It's a lot. Like, of work. How many people? Are, I'm, I'm I'm playing in fucking Springfield, Missouri. How many people are going to come to this gig? That, you know, out of these 5,000 friends, how many people live in that area? Am mm-hmm. I affecting two people? You know, I wish I wish you could narrow it down where you can actually do right. a specific well, area. Well, you, you, if if you spend money, you can. Oh, right. If you do yeah, it on Facebook yeah, ad. Yeah, you do the Facebook ad. Town, yeah. yeah, then, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess that's the only way to really do it. And plus, it's, I mean, it's so tough now, too. It's like, like your, your fan page, you have, what, 62,000 likes. And just a small percentage sees that post. Yeah. Just because of the fucking algorithms, you know? Right, right. It sucks. Yeah. So, I don't know. I don't, you know, it's free, which is good. You know what I mean? Free is always amazing. That's So, that's good. It's free promotion. So, that's huge. But other than that, I just, uh, you know, I try not to get involved in the drama. Yeah, drama's dumb. Well, I, a lot of it you get from there, you know? Oh, my God. It's unbelievable. Someone was just telling me that they thought I was dating this girl because, um... This guy was posting stuff that I was dating this girl. It's like, are you dating? I thought you were dating this girl. That's why I didn't call you. I'm like, why would you think that? Because someone was posting this thing. And I'm like, okay. Uh, yeah, it's weird. Jesus Christ. Um, so <laughs> and so you're in town and you're doing, uh, anybody that's listening live in Los Angeles right now, this uh, this Saturday. Um, tomorrow Is it tomorrow? Tomorrow. tomorrow four tomorrow, o'clock. Four o'clock at Book Soup. You're yeah. doing a book signing. Um you have a lot of these things scheduled? No, this is the last one. I did one in New York. The oh, okay. Last week. I did one in New Jersey. Okay. And I'll do here in L.A. And then, you know, when I'm on the road at my shows, I'll do signings right. after the show. So you so, have books available at your yeah, shows? Yeah, I'll do it that way. That's the best way. How's the how's the response been out so far for the Pretty book? good so far. You know, so far so good. People are enjoying it, you know. Have you read any of the Amazon reviews? Um, I did the other night because uh, my manager's like, hey, there's some reviews up there. And, um... Yeah, and they were been positive, but I don't think anyone's going to go run out the first day to books out and write some negative shit. Like, yeah, that's true. I think you're going to get your fans that are going to buy the book. As it gets out there, and you know, in a few weeks or whatever, somebody might recommend it, or they might pick it up in a Barnes & Noble and go, this is, I don't like this. So then mm-hmm. that's when they'll start coming. I don't care about right. that. You know, well, you know? I, did, I did notice that there's already uh, used hard copies available. Right. 
<laughs> yeah, so what? I guess what do people do? Like something comes out and they buy it? Like how would they? I don't know. They buy it and then they But why it? would they sell it for cheaper, though, if they just bought it? I don't know. I wonder if that's Amazon doing that. That could be. You know what I mean? Like right. Just like the ticket agencies buying up all the tickets for the concerts and then they put them back on the market through StubHub. You know, and they're they're in business with StubHub. So I think that, like, who's going to buy the book the first day for 27 bucks, and then resell it for ten fifty two plus $6 shipping right. and handling? Like, he's not, he didn't read it the first, in one day, and he's not going to lose $11 on a book that he just bought. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't, whatever. I don't really care. How do you feel? You know, in, in three oh. years, the book's going to be in a fucking used bin for for a dollar. <laughs> right? You know, that's, that's just how it goes. Is. Yeah, this yeah, is that's the way just it how is. it goes. Yeah. How do you feel about paid meet and greets? Um, I don't, you know, my nephew does it. My brother, his dad, you know, will pay me a certain band, mm-hmm. you know, as long as it's not outrageous and you want to afford it. I mean, look, I would have done it back in the day if it was 60 bucks to meet Ozzy and get a right? picture with him. You know what I mean? His band and, you know, get there and watch the sound check. I would have fucking done that in a second. I would have saved up my money and did that. I had no shot of ever doing that. Right. As a kid. So, you know, I, I you know, when the band's got to make money, they're not making it through a record company. It's just, mm-hmm. People aren't buying the records anymore as much. So you're not getting the royalties off of that. So you have to make it some other way. So I got no problem with it. Look, if you don't want to do it, just don't do it. You're exactly. not getting, you know, you're still going to get a ticket. You could still go to the show. Mm-hmm. So. Do you see that moving into comedy at all? I don't know. I think some comics do it if they do theaters. I just sell merchandise after the show. I tell them, right. come by the merchandise table after the show. We'll take pictures, whatever. You want to buy something. And if someone doesn't buy anything, I don't give a shit. I'll right. take a picture with them. But yeah. I like meeting people because then they'll come back. They go, hey, it was a good show. I can't, when are you going to come back? I said, probably a year or whatever. Or we'll talk some metal or some comedy or whatever. And people are like, oh, cool, man. I'm going to come back and see them. Like, that's how you build a fan base. Mm-hmm. And if I was, a, you know, as a... As a guy always going to see bands, if the band came out and was, you know, at the, you know, signing stuff, if you bought the the album or the CD, that was like, that's pretty fucking cool. Right. So that's why I always look at yeah. it. Well, I suppose it is different in the clubs as, as opposed to like a theater because in the clubs you're there. You yeah. Know? You know, in the theater you're hiding out backstage and you're not really out in the crowd, but. Right. So, yeah, I guess that does make sense. Makes sense. And here's the awkward silence. <laughs> That's what made that last show so good. There's just like a lot of this awkward silence. Lo- there's nothing better than awkward silence. I know. It's fucking beautiful. <laughs> um, oh, let me see. I'm going to go back to the uh, these chapters here. Um, oh, in the promo, um, something about ketchup. Uh, was it uh, don't put... Uh, I don't put ketchup on my burgers or something like that. Well, just say, like, ketchup is for kids. Oh, ketchup, yes. Well, cause some, I was on a radio show, Opie and Anthony, one time, and mm-hmm. they were eating on the air, and they go, hey, you want some ketchup for those eggs? They go, no, I'm not five years old. I don't use ketchup anymore, and it just caught this whole thing. Like, why don't you like ketchup? And I was like, I didn't even realize that I don't use it anymore. I just like, why would I use I don't, I want to taste my food. You know what I mean? It's like, I go, it's liquid sugar, so it's that's all it is, and... I'm not, I'm not five years old. I don't order French fries and put ketchup on them. And so people went crazy. I did this whole rant about how much I don't like ketchup. It's, you know, because I used to. I said, you just, it's just like a, out of habit. Right. Like when you're a kid, you just, oh, I got to put ketchup. I used to put ketchup on my eggs. And then one day I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? You know, you just reach for it. Okay, I got to reach for the ketchup. So I think that's where it started. So there's a little rant in there about how much I don't like ketchup. Well, because uh, Mark from Three Sides of the Coin uh, commented on that because I, I put that picture up and he goes no i disagree catch uh food is a delivery service for ketchup so he likes ketchup on everything basically is what he was saying well i mean if you if you look at the bottle you look at a bottle of heinz there's like 80 grams of sugar in that yeah, bottle there's a lot so you put it's it's basically like liquid sugar mm-hmm. is what it is and it's just sugar in there giving it the flavor so but it, so just know like so your food must taste like shit there's a reason you don't put ketchup on a, on a nice steak because you, you don't have to. Right. It's good food. So you're basically eating, eating shitty food and covering up by putting ketchup on it, putting like, sugar on it. And you notice there's no ketchup on sliders at White Castle. No. That's how glorious they are. Yeah. They don't need it. Exactly. They don't need it. Uh, Kurt from Denver says, um, ask him about Shotgun Willie's in Denver after his show. Shotgun Willie. 
I don't know if you remember that or not. Was that Shotgun think, Willie in Denver? Is that a strip club? Because I did go to a strip. I did a show in Denver like six months ago. And okay. Was, we went to a strip club afterwards. I don't know. It just says, ask him about Shotgun Willie in Denver after his show. It must have been a strip club because we. I did a rock club in Denver. Mm-hmm. I forget what it was called. And then we went. Then uh, the promoter took me to a strip club. And we went. Yeah, we just hung out, got some lap dances, drank some oh, beers. Yeah. So like you do at strip clubs. Yeah. Because yeah, jiggling cool. titties. Yeah, yeah. So God it was, bless them. It was cool. Yeah. Uh, are there any upcoming, uh, up and coming comics and bands that you're listening to now? Here comes from Scotty again. Um. Well, I, 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 you know, I, I, I guess you know the backlash is already starting with Greta Van Fleet, but I like those guys. Oh, I love those guys; they're great. Yeah, um, I really like them. I saw them at the Mercury Lounge in New York City like four months ago in front of three hundred people, and it was amazing just watching a band. You know, they just announced a tour, and they're selling twenty five hundred tickets in thirty minutes. Of course, they are. I haven't heard of that in so long. I mean, it's good for music; it's good mm-hmm. for rock music. So when everyone's bitching and whether they. You think they sound like Led Zeppelin or whatever, or everyone's talking about them, so you can't like them all of a sudden. You know that's great for for rock music. They, I haven't I haven't seen that in a long. I don't even remember the last time. Right. Where they put it a tour and it sells every show sold out in thirty minutes within thirty it's minutes. Unbelievable. Like forty dates. They're putting second shows on and shit. So it's great. And um, so I like those guys a lot. They got eight songs out, two EPs, and um, as far as comics, uh. Well, Dean Del Rey, he's a, he's a you know he does a podcast. He's a friend of mine. He's mm-hmm. great. You know, there's a guy out of uh, Cleveland that moved to New York. A friend of mine, Chad Zumach, he's making some waves. There's a female comic from L.A., Kate Quigley, who's really funny. Yeah, I've never seen her, but I see her tweets all the time, and she's fucking gorgeous. She's hot and she's funny, and she doesn't take herself serious. She's not up there. I'm I a like feminist, that. and I you know I hate men. You know what I mean? She's like yeah, and but she talks about herself. And the you know usually in comedy, if a girl was hot. It caused problems because the female at the table, whether it's the wife or the girlfriend, would get jealous because the guy she's with is like, oh, man, she's hot. And then she, she talks about sex. The girl, the, you know, the jealous, she comes out. She goes, oh, my God, why would a girl talk like that? That's disgusting. That used to go on a lot. Mm-hmm. But it seems like it has, you know, in the last like seven, eight years, Amy Schumer doing dirty humor. And she's cute. And she, they, they, they broke through that barrier. So you could be cute and telling raunchy jokes up there. But she doesn't take herself seriously, makes fun of herself. The women in the crowd love her, which I was like, I don't know how the women are going to like her because she's hot. Uh, but they, they like her even more than the guy. Like, the guys come because she's hot, and she's mm-hmm. funny. But she backs it up. So I like that, you know. So, you know, there's some there's some new, new people out there. And there's clips of everybody out there, which is great. Right. You know, right. so you can always uh, seek them out. It, back to this Greta, Greta Van Fleet, Fleet thing. The thing that I really dig about them is they're fucking young. I mean, they're like, what, 18? Yeah, know? the two, there's three brothers and the best friend is on drums. Mm-hmm. The two twins are 19, guitar and bass player. The singer, who's the older brother, he's 21. The drummer's 21. Yeah, and you get some young kids like that. And, I mean, the age of the rock star is gone. But you get these young kids like that that might make people younger than want to pick up a fucking guitar. Yeah, you know? and if they start getting a younger audience, when I saw them at the Mercury Lounge, it was all middle-aged dudes. Right. But if they start getting a younger audience, 19, 20-year-olds, to see them and build, and then they got bands open and form, it could really change the rock mm-hmm. scene. Slowly, but it could definitely right. do. It could be great. You know, if you get the young generation into those. Yep. Bands, those all, it, all it takes is a bunch of hot, young um, high school chicks. The girls. The, the girls. The exactly. Exactly. That was what that was all my whole thing with Steel Panther. People like, oh, they're just, they're making fun of the eighties music. They're a joke. I go, they're bringing hot chicks to rock shows. Exactly. I go, that that's been missing for a long time. Mm-hmm. I go, or it's just a fun show. That was like an eighties show. When you go into an eighties show, like you know, back in the eighties, those all it was just a big party. Yeah. Everyone's hooking up. You're making out with somebody in the fucking crowd. You just met at the concert. You're fucking hooking up. It was just a big party, and that's what Steel Panther finally brought back. And people are like, oh, they're a fucking joke. I'm like, they're, they're fun. It's just a fun band to go watch. Exactly. Yeah, I know. It's not serious. I get it. I get what they're doing. But they're really fucking good they're, at what they they're do. They're amazing yeah, at what they do. Yeah, they're amazing musicians. And it's like a well-oiled fucking Vegas routine. When you, when, you know, Monday nights when they would play here at, you know, uh, on, the, on the Sunset Strip and do, draw like 800 people on a Monday yeah. night and sell it out. I mean, that was great for music. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I they're agree. good dudes. So you know, I always support those guys. 
That's fucking great. Um, so, so really quick, uh, the the book is available. You can get it on uh, Amazon and all your all your. And it's in bookstores, in Target, bookstores. Barnes and Noble, yeah. all that stuff. Everybody is awful except you. You know, it's just a rant book. Mm -hmm. There's jokes on all the pages. You know what I mean? It's just you can open up anywhere and just start reading. And it's just you know, if you if you know if you see through all the nonsense on social media, you got a good sense of humor. You'll like it. And uh, they want to find you on social media. It's it's uh, is it real Jim Florentine on Twitter? No, it's uh, Mr. Jim. Florentine. Mr. Jim Florentine. Okay, there you go. And uh, the uh, the website is it's Jim Florentine dot com. Florentine all the shit's com. Up there, yeah. Yeah, and you can get all of his uh, social media links there. And um, obviously, you have a lot of dates coming up. I'm assuming. Yeah, I'll be in Baltimore, St. Louis, Vegas the next few months. So. I'm always out there. Always out there. Always working, Jim. Dude, it was a pleasure. Thank yeah, you course, again, absolutely, man. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so yeah, and Thank, thanks, Mark. <laughs> thanks, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> check out the book. Check out all the social media. Hold on, I'm gonna hit the outro music here, just so I don't have to edit it in later. All right. Thanks to Jim Florentine again. Check out his book. It is called Everybody's Awful Except for You. Go buy it. Then go to one of the shows and have him sign it. Or buy it at one of the shows and have him sign it. Sign it. Do all that kind of good shit. Make sure you hit up all my social media. It's Real Izzy Presley on the Twitter machine on my quest for 1 million followers. Currently about 2,000. I'm getting there. Creeping up oh, slowly. Yeah, yeah. Um, also the same on Instagram. Our Facebook page is Real. Oh, no, 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 no. That's a fucking Twitter. It is uh, another epic podcast on, on uh, Facebook and on uh, another Facebook, my entertainment stuff, everything I'm doing entertainment-wise. Is it Presley 1? Go like those pages. And all that good stuff. We'll see you next week. I can't remember who the guest is, but we will for sure be live at The Other Door in North Hollywood on Sunday, on Sunday the 4th of March. And I'll let you know who the guest is coming up on that. So we'll see you then. Folks, it is true. I do love you all. Why don't you kindly go fuck yourself?